The outline of this training is based on the Louisiana Fit Kids Manager training on meal patterns with recent updates and waiver information added for CNP operators to make informed decisions as well as to reinforce the understanding of the school breakfast program and offer versus serve. First up is an overview of the 2018 final rule, which was vacated, canceling menu flexibilities that were put in place for milk, whole grains, and sodium. It is important to understand that while menu flexibilities may be achieved through waivers due to the pandemic considerations, menus must be planned to meet the initial meal pattern flexibilities in 2012 that were without the flexibilities currently in place. To explain the reason for the elimination of menu flexibilities, on April 13th, 2020, the U.S. Di District Court for the District of Maryland found a procedural error with the promulgation of the 2018 final rule for child nutrition programs. This previously allowed meal pattern flexibilities for milk, whole grains, and sodium requirements. As a result, the flexibilities described in the 2018 rule were vacated or canceled. What this means is that for the school year 21-22, NSLP and SBP meal patterns must follow the following guidelines. Flavored milk may be only non-fat. That means no 1% chocolate or strawberry milk. All grains must be whole grain rich. School lunches and breakfasts offered through NSLP and SBP must meet target two sodium levels as defined in 7 CFR 21010C and 220.8C. Due to the pandemic, there are meal pattern flexibilities in place to allow SFAs to waive these stricter requirements where necessary. USDA's COVID-19 nutrition response number 90, listed on the CMP website as memo SFS 21144, is titled Nationwide Waiver to Allow Specific School Meal Pattern Flexibility for School Year 2021-2022, and it is linked in the title of this slide. Submission of this waiver with a justification will allow for specific meal pattern requirements to be waived on a case-by-case -case basis. This will allow CMP operators additional time where necessary due to the pandemic related supply chain issues or other related hardships to meet the stricter requirements for milk, whole grains, or sodium. SFA should ensure that moving forward, menus are planned based on the requirements of the 2012 final rule and meet menu certification guidelines. A separate waiver is included in the waiver section of the CMP online application to allow SFAs to keep the target one sodium guidelines in place instead of moving to the stricter target two guidelines. In many cases due to supply chain issues, some of the specialized or lower sodium items that are typically available are now limited in terms of distribution or availability. For this reason, most SFAs are opting in to the waiver to stick with the target one sodium guidelines for this school year. Please continue to make plans and research options with the goal of meeting the target two sodium guidelines as soon as feasible or by next school year. Waivers may be submitted for specific school meal pattern flexibilities due to the COVID-19 pandemic if there is an adequate justification submitted. Those waivers include allowance for the flexibilities that were vacated, including those for target two sodium requirements, the requirement that all grains offered are whole grain rich and that flavored milk must be fat free. Additional flexibilities that may be waived include that for pre-K, at least one serving per day of grains must be whole grain rich. A variety of vegetables from the vegetable subgroups must be offered. Two different options of fluid milk must be served menus, serving sizes, and food components for specified age grade groups must be required in, this, in the stated combinations. So there are a variety of meal pattern flexibilities available. Please um, log on to the CMP website and go to the waiver section in your school food service online application to review the possibilities and also to select those that you will need um, to continue um, serving the menus that you're planning for this year 
and um, make sure that you consider different issues related to your supply chain or your vendors, uh, what your vendors have communicated. Next, we will discuss the school breakfast program meal pattern, starting with defining food components versus food items. Now, this area is going to, and when we talk about food components and food items, we're primarily focusing on school breakfast, but there will be some overlap with lunch as we go through discussing meal patterns. At breakfast, there are three components that must be offered on the serving line every day, milk, grain, and fruit. The meat, meat alternate, and vegetable components are not part of the breakfast meal pattern. All three components must be available to all children who come through the serving line. A food item is the specific food that is offered to meet the component requirement. In this slide, strawberries are the food item being served to meet the fruit component. Toast is the food item offered to meet the grain component and milk is the food item offered as the milk component. Note that meat meat alternate is not a required component in the school breakfast program. Now let's discuss the difference between ounce equivalents versus ounces for a product. Let's discuss, let's start with a discussion of ounces. One physical ounce for a product generally weighs 28 grams. This holds true no matter what item is being measured, whether it be metal, feathers, clay, dirt, plastic, clothing, or food. If you have one physical ounce of something, it weighs 28 grams. Many of you probably already know this from weighing products for recipes. However, when we say how much meat a food item contributes to the meat meat alternate component, we can't always use physical ounces. So for some meat alternate foods, it takes either more or less than one physical ounce to provide a one ounce equivalent serving of meat meat alternate to credit. If you think about a chicken nugget that is made of chicken and coated in breading, when you weigh that nugget, the weight includes the amount of the meat and the amount of grain from that breading. Look at this example of a grilled chicken patty. The patty weighs 3.8 ounces. Note that the crediting information reports a three ounce equivalent meat meat alternate, while 0.8 of this product does not credit as meat or meat alternate for the child nutrition program. What do you think is the case? The reason that it credits as only three ounces of meat meat alternate is because the manufacturer added other ingredients such as water, cornstarch, salt, and vinegar. Those ingredients weigh 0.8 ounces. Also remember that the percentage of fat in the meat may affect the yield or crediting. When using fresh products, use the food buying guide to determine the amount of raw product to purchase in order to serve a cooked product that meets crediting requirements for that menu item. For example, an 80-20 ground beef, which is 80% lean and 20% fat, will credit less for lean meat, pound for pound, than a 90-10 or 90% lean and 10% fat product. This, this slide lists some foods and food items that are frequently used to meet the meat meat alternate component, along with the serving size of the food item needed to count as one ounce equivalent of meat. For actual meat, which includes beef, chicken, pork, and fish, it takes one ounce of meat to equal one ounce equivalent. If you weighed a piece of cooked meat, a one ounce piece would equal a one ounce equivalent serving for the child nutrition program. You should not include bone, skin, or breading when weighing the meat. Cheese, nuts, and seeds are the same. One physical ounce of cheese, nuts, or seeds equals one ounce equivalent of meat meat alternate. Now what about peanut butter? It takes two tablespoons of peanut butter to provide a one ounce equivalent serving of meat meat alternate. It takes one fourth cup of beans without the liquid to get one ounce equivalent of meat meat alternate. It takes a half of a large egg to equal one ounce equivalent of meat. 
It takes one half cup of yogurt to provide just one ounce equivalent of meat. A one half cup of yogurt weighs over 100 grams. So it takes a much heavier portion of yogurt to give us just one ounce equivalent of meat meat alternate. And this is where the food buying guide really comes into play. Um, make sure that you identify the appropriate item and how much that item must weigh in order to credit appropriately for the child nutrition program. Remember we said earlier that meat meat alternate is not a required component at breakfast. However, meat can be credited to meet the grain component at breakfast, but first the menu must include at least one ounce equivalent of an actual bread grain. So if you served a sausage biscuit for breakfast, you would count the serving of meat meat alternate from the sausage in the grain component. The same thing goes with the eggs and the toast. The key is that you have to have an ounce of grain on the menu before meat may be counted toward the total grains. You cannot have only meat and no actual bread grain offered if you want that to count. Next, we will go over the grain component. Remember grain is a required meal pattern component for breakfast and all grains served must be whole grain rich. By USDA definition for a product to be considered whole grain rich, at least 50% of the grain must be whole grain and the rest of the grain must be enriched. So remember that unless you um, decide to use a flexibility for this school year by electing a waiver um, to serve part of your products as not whole grain rich, all of them must be whole grain rich. Food items that are used to meet the grain component can be divided into two categories, baked goods and cereals. Baked goods include breads, buns, biscuits, crackers, chips, and taco shells made with whole corn, tortillas, cornbread, cinnamon rolls, and other items. Cereal grains include rice, pasta, hot cereal, and dry cereal. Even though we call them cereal grains, they aren't all what we commonly think of as breakfast cereal. Occasionally, there is confusion about potato products because Outside of the school meal programs, potato products are commonly thought of as starch, starches or starchy foods. Sometimes this makes people want to count them toward the grain component, but potato products never count toward meeting the grain component for school breakfast or school lunch. Potato products such as mashed potatoes and french fries are considered vegetables and can be used to meet the vegetable component. Similar to meat meat alternates, we measure the serving size of a grain food item in ounce equivalents. We have to use ounce equivalents because sometimes it takes either more or less than one physical ounce of a grain food item to equal a one ounce equivalent serving of grain. If the grain item we are serving contains only that grain and has no other ingredients, one physical ounce of the product is a one ounce equivalent serving of grain. Dry cereal grains such as rice, pasta, grits, oatmeal, and dry breakfast cereals with no extra ingredients, like marshmallows, can be measured like this because in their dry form, they do not contain any other ingredient. But what about baked goods such as breads, biscuits, buns, crackers, cornbread, cinnamon rolls, and taco shells? These products aren't made of just grain. The grain is mixed with other ingredients such as sugar, baking powder, oil, dry milk, etc. So how do you know how many ounce equivalents of grain these foods count for? You can't tell just by weighing them or looking at the weight on the label. If the food item has a CN label, the label will tell you how many ounce equivalents of grain the food item provides. For example, pop tarts, chicken nuggets, pizza, a standardized recipe will usually also tell you how many ounces or ounce equivalents of grain the food item provides. But what about if the product like sliced bread, a pre-made roller biscuit, a taco shell, etc., does not have a CN label or statement? In those cases, you can look up the product on a chart made by USDA, or it can be located by looking up the Exhibit A grain requirements for child nutrition programs. When completing production records, make sure to write the serving sizes 
of bread products in ounce equivalents, such as a two ounce equivalent whole grain rich roll, and the serving size for rice and pasta in cups, such as one half cup of rice. This is what the exhibit A grain requirements for child nutrition programs looks like. There are additional footnotes that are not included on this page to help explain how to credit these items. You may access the exhibit A chart by clicking the link title on this slide. Note that when using this chart, you will use the middle column for crediting information for school meals. You will also notice that grains are grouped based on how they credit per ounce of product weight. Items in group G, like toaster pastries and cereal bars, credit at a lower ounce equivalent per product ounce than something like bread. For example, a whole grain toaster pastry requires a two ounce product weight to credit for only one ounce equivalent bread grain, while a slice of whole grain bread will credit for one ounce equivalent based on a one ounce product weight. Fruit is another component that is part of both the breakfast and school lunch meal patterns. Food items that may be used to meet the fruit requirement include fresh fruit, frozen fruit without added sugar, fruit canned in juice, light syrup or water. Dried fruit such as raisins or dried cranberries count toward the fruit component. Fruit juice also counts toward the juice component. If juice is served, it must be 100% juice. It cannot be a product that is a juice blend or a punch unless it is a fruit punch made with 100% juice. Now more than half the weekly fruit requirement can be met with juice. Fruit has additional benefits such as fiber that juice does not contain. So it is important that students are given fruit and not just the juice. All schools have to offer one cup of fruit component each morning at breakfast. When I say one cup of fruit component, I mean fruit and or juice. A school could give the students one cup of solid fruit, just canned, fresh or frozen every day and no juice, but a school could not give the students one cup of fruit juice every day. What is most traditional is to provide one half cup of some type of canned fresh or frozen fruit and then one half cup of juice on a daily basis to ensure that juice will not make up more than half of the fruit component. The serving size of fruit is always measured in cups. To figure out the serving size of the fruit item, you can use the CN label for a few pre-made products such as frozen fruit juice pop. Typically you will use the food buying guide though. For example, if you were serving whole banana as a 150 count per case item, the food buying guide tells us that the amount of fruit each banana provides is one half cup. If you are writing this food item on a production record, you would write one each, one half cup. Most fruit servings credit as the actual volume served, meaning if you provide a half cup, of sliced pears, it credits as one half cup of fruit. Dried fruits are different than other fruit because they credit as twice the volume served. So if raisins were on the menu, to provide a student with one half cup of fruit component, you would only serve the student one fourth cup of raisins. The vegetable component is part of the lunch meal pattern, but vegetables are not considered a component on their own at breakfast. However, vegetables may be used to meet the fruit component at breakfast. Items such as salsa, hash browns, or vegetable juice may count toward the fruit component. If vegetable juice is offered, it counts as part of the weekly juice limit, which should con con constitute less than or equal to 50% of the fruit component over the, over the course of the week. The vegetable component is unique because it is divided into subgroups. This will be discussed in more detail during the upcoming lunch menu pattern training. The poster on this slide is available on the Institute of Child Nutrition website, and it's important to post this wherever staff is making decisions about menus and or how to make menu substitutions. There are five subgroups of vegetables, dark green, red orange, beans, peas, also called legumes, starchy vegetables, and other vegetables.
vegetables are placed into sub subgroups based on their nutrient content. The vegetables in each subgroup have similar nutrient content. Color is a general guide to where a vegetable belongs, but does not always determine the subgroup. For example, broccoli and green beans are both green, but broccoli is in the dark green subgroup and green beans falls in the other subgroup because they provide different nutrients. Lunch menus must contain vegetables from each of these subgroups during the week. The vegetable subgroups can be offered in any order as long as the weekly requirements are met. It is important to know what vegetables belong in each subgroup so that the meal pattern is planned to meet the weekly requirements and appropriate substitutions can be made if needed. Beans and peas must be offered weekly as a vegetable because legumes are a subgroup. And although this, this um, training is typically covering school breakfast program areas, um, this kind of will continue into the lunch program instruction that we're providing next week. So if beans are offered more frequently, they can be counted in the meat component or the vegetable component, but never both at the same time. For example, red beans and rice with sausage and without sausage. The serving size of vegetables is always measured in cups. To figure out the serving size of the vegetable item, you will typically use the food buying guide. Occasionally, a pre-made product containing vegetables may have a CN label. Most fruit servings credit as the actual volume served, meaning if you provide one half cup of canned corn, it credits as one half cup of vegetable. Raw leafy salad greens are different than other vegetables because they credit as half the volume served. So if romaine lettuce was on the menu to provide a student with one half cup of the vegetable component, you must serve the student one physical cup of romaine lettuce. The minimum, the minimum creditable serving of vegetables is one eighth cup. Now let's talk about the menu um, component for milk. One cup of milk or eight fluid ounces must be offered to all students in all grade levels at breakfast and lunch every day. While in past years, a flexibility was provided to allow all milk, whether flavored or unflavored at 1% or fat-free, USDA has provided instruction that moving forward, flavored milk must be fat-free. 2% milk and whole milk are not allowed in any form, flavor or unflavored. Students must be given at least two options to choose from at each meal service. However, one option must be unflavored milk. As a reminder, fluid milk is the only food item that may be used to meet the milk component. Other food items that are considered dairy items, such as eggs, cheese, and even yogurt, will not meet the milk component. What component group these, do these dairy food items belong to? So um, you see here the egg and the cheese and the yogurt. These items belong in the meat alternate group and must be credited based on the food buying guide. Other foods are foods that do not meet any component requirements. They may be used as condiments, seasonings, or to improve student acceptability or participation in meal services. Calories, saturated fat, and sodium must be counted in weekly nutrient averages. There is a list of other foods in the USDA food buying guide linked on this slide. Notice that pork bacon is not considered a meat and does not count toward the meat meat alternate component at lunch or the grain component at breakfast. This is because there is little protein in bacon. It is primarily fat. If bacon is served with any meal, it must be considered an extra item. Bacon has a lot of calories, fat, and sodium also. So it typically can't even be served as an extra since there are weekly calorie, fat, and sodium limits for each meal pattern. Remember that these items may affect the nutritional content of meals and the dietary specification outcome during the administrative review process. Use care to ensure balanced menus in terms of nutritional content on average over each week 
and to ensure fat, sodium, and calories will not exceed USDA guidelines when these other foods are added to menus. When making substitutions for failed deliveries of certain food items, make sure you substitute within the same component group. When it comes to vegetables, be sure to substitute within the same vegetable subgroup. So as is listed on um, this slide, if you had to substitute for a fruit, you would want to substitute for another fruit item, grain to grain, fluid milk to fluid milk, vegetable to vegetable, and meat, al meat alternate to another meat, meat alternate. Next up for dis discussion, um, we're gonna focus on the breakfast meal pattern and then offer this versus serve. So to review the basics of the breakfast meal pattern, three components are required, including milk, grain, and fruit. The components have minimum daily and weekly serving size requirements. At breakfast, there are four grade group categories, K through five, six through eight, nine through 12, and K through 12. Many schools that have multiple grade levels use the K through 12 meal pattern at breakfast because it means you can offer all students the same serving sizes. For the fruit group, which may also be met with vegetable items, each grade level must be offered one cup of fruit, including juice, on the serving line at breakfast each day. For the milk group, the serving size is also one cup for all grades each day. For the grain groups, excuse me, for the grain group, the minimum daily serving size is the same each day, one ounce equivalent. That means that every day all students must be offered at least one ounce of grain, but there are also weekly grain minimums. For the K through five group, these students must be offered a minimum of seven ounces of grain during the week. If they were only offered the minimum daily requirement of one ounce each day, they would only get five ounces of grain for the week. This would not be enough to meet the weekly requirement. Therefore, students must be offered more than one ounce equivalent of grain several days during the week. Frequently, students are all offered a minimum of two ounce equivalent of grain each day to ensure that both the daily and weekly minimums are met. Grades, K, grades six through eight have a minimum serving requirement of eight ounce equivalent of grain per week. And grades nine through 12 and the K through 12 group have a minimum of nine ounce of grain per week. Again, because the serving sizes among all components are so similar across the grade groups, a K through 12 grade group may be used. There are also weekly calorie, saturated fat, and sodium limits for menus. When the menu's nutrients are averaged over the course of the week, Grades K through five should have between 350 and 500 calories per day with less than 10% of the calories coming from saturated fat. And the menu should have less than 540 milligrams of sodium. And remember that that is based on the um, target one guidelines and the target two guidelines are a bit stricter for sodium. The K through five grade group meal pattern was discussed to provide direction on how to read the meal pattern chart. When you have time, please take, please take time to review the six through eight, nine through 12 and K through 12 meal patterns in order to be familiar with the grade group options and requirements for breakfast. Sodium, the sodium target two requires that on average for a five day week, sodium- Every day. Um, hello. Can you can you please That's mute? You. I got four. I mean, you have to ask them what car they got. Okay, someone someone so is not four. muted and is talking right now. Could oh, you please mute? Six. Okay, well he got six. I don't, I don't know. Okay. Oh, okay. I'll ask him in a moment. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Whoever was just talking to someone, please mute, so that um so that we can't hear your discussions. Thank you. So sodium target two requires on average for a five day week that sodium is less than or equal to 485 milligrams for grades, grades K through five, 
535 milligrams for grades six through eight and 570 milligrams for grades nine through 12. As you can see, compared to the target one sodium restrictions, the target two restrictions are a bit stricter and will require a closer look at condiments like ketchup and seasonings that contain salt. In addition, operators should ensure that canned vegetable specifications are written to ensure there is no added salt. Also, SFA should look out for the sodium content in processed foods. At breakfast, in addition to the food component requirements, there are also food item requirements. You have to have three components on the serving line every day and four food items on the serving line. Each one half cup of fruit can be counted as an item and each ounce of grain can be counted as an item, even if they are in one physical piece of food. It is up to the person who plans the menu to decide whether foods such as a two ounce muffin will be counted as two items or as one item. Usually a menu planner is going to count every one half cup of fruit and ounce of grain as an item, but they don't have to as long as there are a minimum of four items on the line. In this example, we have one half cup of strawberries, which is one item, and one half cup of juice, which is an item, to meet the one cup fruit component. Because these are each counted as one item, we have two items in the fruit component. We have a one ounce slice of toast, which is one item, and one cup of milk, which is one item. Therefore, we have four food items from three components. In this example, we have an apple that counts as one cup of fruit, we know this because we looked it up in the food buying guide. Apples and other fresh fruits are typically credited by the count per case. Apples with a higher count per case yield a smaller serving size, while a smaller, a smaller count per case will yield a larger serving size. <coughs> in this case, each one half cup of fruit in the apple counts as one item, so we have two fruit items. We now have two pieces of toast that each weigh one ounce, so we have two grain items. We also have one cup of milk, which counts as one item for a total of five items. In this example, we have one half an apple, which is one half cup and counts as one item. We have one half cup juice, which counts as one item, and two pieces of toast, each one ounce slice of toast counts as one item, so we have two additional items. And last, there's one cup of milk, which is one item. This gives us a total of five items. In this example, we have a two ounce muffin instead of toast. We still have five food items because each ounce, each, excuse me, each ounce equivalent of grain can count as one food item. Therefore, even though we have four physical pieces of food, we have five food items available for this breakfast. In our last example, we have a whole apple, a two ounce muffin and milk. We have three physical pieces of food here, but let's count how many items. Each one half cup of apple counts as one item. So we have two fruit items. Each ounce of grain counts as one item so we have two grain items and we have one milk item. We have a total of five food items, even though physically we just have three things. Okay, so right now we're going to, I'm going to turn it over to Babette Lanius, who's gonna start with offer versus serve and explaining how that works at breakfast. All right, Babette, are you ready to get started? Just have to unmute myself. All right, we are going to talk about offer versus serve. Um, offer versus serve, as you know, is a concept that applies to menu planning and menu service as well. It allows students to decline some of the food items offered that are in a reimbursable breakfast. The goal of offer versus serve is to reduce food waste and to permit students to choose the foods that they want to eat. 
your local school system will decide whether to use the offer versus serve provision for breakfast. If your school system utilizes offer versus serve, the school will implement the guidelines you are learning about in this module. USDA does not require any schools or grade levels at breakfast to use offer versus serve. However, many schools do choose to use offer versus serve at breakfast because it prevents some food waste. So under offer versus serve, the students are required to take a minimum of three food items at breakfast. And of course, one of those food items has to be a half a cup of fruit component. So we're going to do a skills review. You're going to look at each one of the um, menus, pay close attention to the grade level and the serving sizes, and then look at each student meal. I'm only going to give you a few seconds to determine if it's a complete meal. I hope you have pencil and paper at hand. Remember that three food items, including a half a cup of fruit, is required at breakfast. If the meal is complete, check reimbursable on a sheet of, a sheet of paper. Otherwise, check non-reimbursable. So as we begin a test of your skills in identifying a reimbursable meal under breakfast in offer versus serve, Get your pencil and pen ready, pencil or pen ready to write down your answers. The first breakfast includes a two ounce whole grain bagel, which remember counts as two items, a half cup of fresh orange red wedges, which counts as one item, a half cup of banana that counts as one item, and one cup of milk, which counts as one item. This gives us a total of five menu items and meets the USDA meal pattern requirement for the school breakfast program. Next, we'll start on the meal selection student picked up from menu number one. We'll assess the tray and decide if this is a reimbursable breakfast or not. Remember, as we go through the slides, first check to see if the student picked up a half a cup of fruit and look and see if three full items were selected. So this student chose a half a cup of orange slices and a two ounce bagel. Is this menu a reimbursable meal? This student selected the bagel and a cup of milk. Is that a reimbursable meal? Meal number three, the student shows a cup of milk, a half a cup of banana, and a two ounce bagel. Is meal number three reimbursable? Number four, one cup of milk and a half cup of orange slices. Is it a reimbursable meal? Meal number five, a cup of milk, a half a cup of banana, and a half a cup of oranges. Is that a reimbursable meal? So let's check your answers. Menu number one is reimbursable. It includes a half a cup of fruit as orange wedges, which is one item, and each ounce equivalent of the bagel counts as one item. So the two ounce bagel counts as two items at breakfast. So this meal does contain three food items and a half a cup of fruit. So it is indeed reimbursable. Meal number two, is it a reimbursable meal? No, there are three food items, including the two ounce bagel and a cup of milk, but the student didn't choose the required half cup of fruit to complete the meal. Meal number three, the student chose half a cup of fruit as a banana, the two ounce bagel and the that counts as two items and the one cup of meal, milk. 
There are four items total and the required half cup of fruit or vegetable. Meal number four is not reimbursable. It only includes a half cup of fruit, such as orange wedges, but the only other item that was selected was one cup of milk. The total number of items selected is only two instead of the three required items. Meal number five includes more than the minimum amount of fruit with both orange wedges and banana. That provides two food items just under the fruit and the one cup portion of milk is the third item for a complete breakfast meal. The second breakfast includes an egg, cheese, and ham English muffin breakfast sandwich, which contains a two ounce English muffin, which counts as two items. The egg counts as one meat meat alternate. Cheese is a half an ounce and ham is a half an ounce. So the English muffin bre breakfast sandwich counts as four ounces of bread grain, which is four items. Mixed fruit counts as one cup, which is two items. And last, the milk counts as one item. The total number of items is seven. And this menu contains all the requirements for a reimbursable breakfast meal. So meal number one, the student chose the English muffin with the egg, the cheese and the ham and one cup of milk. Is this a reimbursable breakfast? This meal number two, the student chose one cup of mixed fruit and the English muffin sandwich. Is this a reimbursable breakfast? Meal three, the student chose a cup of milk and a cup of mixed fruit. Is this a reimbursable breakfast? So let's check your answers. Meal number one is not reimbursable. It includes three items, but not the minimum half cup fruit requirement. Meal number two, it is reimbursable because it includes the minimum half cup of fruit plus four additional items that are included in the breakfast sandwich. Meal number three is reimbursable. It includes a minimum of half cup fruit. The fruit cup is a one cup serving, so it counts as two items. And the third item is one cup of milk. Let's do another menu. So this menu contains a, a strawberry smoothie that has a half cup of strawberries and a half cup of yogurt. It also has a corn muffin, which counts as one ounce equivalent and counts as one item. The orange wedges are a half a cup, which counts as one item. And then there's the milk, which counts as one item. So the total number of menu items for this menu is five and it does meet the school breakfast program menu requirements. So this student chose the one ounce muffin, a strawberry smoothie, which contains, remember a half cup of strawberries and a half cup of yogurt. Is that a reimbursable breakfast? This student chose one half cup of orange wedges, the strawberry smoothie that contains half cup of strawberries and a half cup of yogurt. Is this reimbursable? And this student only wanted the smoothie and it only contains one half cup of strawberries and a half cup of yogurt. Is that reimbursable? So let's check your answers. Meal number one includes a half cup of fruit and smoothie, also a half cup of yogurt. So it's one ounce meat meat alternate. The meat for alternate counts as bread grain because the corn muffin is counted as the real true bread grain. So the smoothie and the corn muffin equals three items. So it is a reimbursable meal. On number three, uh, 
the, this student chose the smoothie and oranges that have a cup of fruit or vegetables. So the student has one half cup of fruit in the orange and two more items in the smoothie. So yes, it is a reimbursable meal. Now this student, the one that only wanted the smoothie, there is a half cup of portion of fruit and then it also has the yogurt, but that only counts as two items. So this is in fact not a reimbursable meal. That's the last of our presentation. If anybody has any questions, please reach out to us. Um, you can ask questions in the chat feature. We'll give a couple of minutes to ask questions. Okay, I of hope course, everyone did very well on the quiz. Um, I'm going to take a look at the chat box and I did see one question um, that asked how many ounces are required of grains for breakfast and that is really dependent on um, the grade group. Um, there are daily and weekly requirements for grain that we discussed so that is based on the age group. Um, typically what we see, especially if there's a K through 12 grade group being used is that two ounces equivalent grain would be provided every day at breakfast to meet the K through 12 weekly requirement for grains. Just makes it a little less confusing and it's really not a whole lot to have to provide, um, especially as part of offer versus serve. Are there any other questions? Because it's the only question that I've seen so far. Um, if I don't see anything else come up in chat, then I did want to um, conclude the school breakfast program meal pattern and offer versus serve training. I'll take a look um, at the chat, chat box again and I will um, email you if there are additional questions. Um, remember that in order to receive credit for today's webinar, please log in to the Louisiana Fits, FitKids.com website and complete the online survey. Um, thank you to everyone for your time and attention today during this training. If you have any questions, please contact the Louisiana Department of Education, Nutrition, at, nutrition Support at ChildNutritionPrograms.gov or call 225-342-9661. Thank you so much.